let's look at the structures on the heart of this plastic model. When I'm orienting myself to this structure, I need to think about the patient's right and the patient's left. This is the patient's right because the person is facing me. This is the patient's left because the person is facing me. Another way to remember that this is the right side on this model is that the right side is painted blue. And that tells us that it is deoxygenated blood on that side. So if you get confused on an exam, just check out the color of the model. The right side is deoxygenated, so this must be the right side. Now we're looking at this heart and we want to think of something we could find every time that would orient us, meaning that we could always tell whether we were on the anterior or the posterior surface of these uh, specimens and or were we at the top, uh, meaning were we at the superior versus the inferior or were we at the base versus the apex. One thing you can always see on this model, which I like to think of as the nose on the heart, kind of like the nose on your face that sticks out uh, right furthest to the anterior is this blue thing here. This blue thing here is the pulmonary trunk. And the pulmonary trunk is going to divide into the left pulmonary artery, the left pulmonary artery, and the right pulmonary artery. The right pulmonary artery. So the pulmonary trunk divides into the left and right pulmonary arteries. That goes on the way to the lungs with the deoxygenated blood. So we've got pulmonary trunk as our identifier. We'll come back to where it is within the flow of blood through the heart in a moment. The next thing I can see clearly is this red thing, and the red thing is the aorta. The aorta loops around in a U shape called the aortic arch, the aortic arch. If you're studying this later on, you can come back and see that on the sheet part, there are two pipes sticking off the top, whereas humans have three branches off of the aortic arch. We have the brachiocephalic trunk, which goes to the right side and splits into the carotid and subclavian, uh, the right and left, uh, the right common carotid and the left subclavian. So this is the brachiocephalic trunk. Number 14 is the left common carotid artery. And number 15 is the left subclavian going to the left arm. I don't think that's on this left uh, this exam. So let's just think about the aorta turning into the aortic arch. Number 11 is the ascending aorta. And then as we go down the back of the heart, we've got the descending aorta. So it makes sense that we would have an aortic arch in the middle between those two things. We're looking here, what's the next thing I can see? I can see the pulmonary trunk, the aorta, and now I can see this, uh, this blue structure here. This large blue structure behind the aorta is the superior vena cava, the superior vena cava. If there's a superior one, there must be an inferior one. And in fact, here is the inferior vena cava. The inferior vena cava looks like this from the bottom. So the inferior and superior vena cava come together at the right atrium. The right atrium is deoxygenated, as you can see it's blue, and it has these, this structure on it that looks like an ear. You'll notice there's one on the right and there's one on the left. The one on the right is called the right auricle. Right auricle. Auricle means ear, and this in fact does look like an ear. Looks like an elephant ear, I think. So if we open the right auricle, if we look into our model, we can look into the right atrium where we know that there is deoxygenated blood that came from the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava. You can see where they entered right here. The superior vena cava has a little red dot in there. And then the inferior vena cava has a large red dot here. All right, so now we're in the right atrium, we need to get down to the right ventricle. We need to get downstairs, if you will, from upstairs to downstairs. And how we're going to do that is go through a passageway or go through a door or go through what's called the tricuspid valve. Tricuspid valve. And we can see that it's tricuspid because we can count the number, at least on here, we can count 
the number of groups of these chords. There are three groups of chords. One, two, three. And they are attached to three cusps. The cusps are a little harder to see on this video from this angle, but a cusp is just a flap of tissue. The cusp is held or anchored by these groups of chords. The groups of chords are called chordiae tendineae. Uh, chordiae tendineae, and they are the anchors which pull the door shut after the blood leaves from the right atrium and passes through into the right ventricle. So the cords are the ways that the door is able to stay closed against the pressure of the heart squeezing. The cords are anchored to this heart wall, this right ventricle wall, by a ridge of muscle called a papillary muscle. And here it's labeled as number 40 and number 42 and number 62, I believe. But, excuse me, but this is a ridge of muscle. Let's look at the left side of the heart and you'll be able to see a papillary muscle a little better, I think. So the ridge that you see in here, the ridge, this ridge here, this is a papillary muscle where a cord is anchored, a group of cords is anchored. So the papillary muscle is a ridge that sticks up even more than these little beams that you see. So let's go back to our right ventricle. Note that I mentioned the little beams, and let's look out here. Let's look out here. This is where I opened up the right ventricle, and we're looking at this interior surface of the heart, and notice that it looks very much like trabecular bone or spongy bone. And in fact, these little beams, which is what trabecular means, are called trabecula carniae. Trabecula carniae. Trabecula carniae are the interior surface of the heart, these little beams that you will see. All right, so we've got a papillary muscle which is anchoring the chordae tendineae, and that pulls the valve shut so that we can shut that door on the way out of this right ventricle. We need to go to the lungs to get oxygen. We're still on the deoxygenated side. So now we need to go to the lungs. We're going to go to the lungs via a door and go out to the pulmonary trunk. So let's look at that. I want to get to this structure here, this pulmonary trunk. In order to do that, I'm gonna go out this door. This is our next valve that we're gonna exit. This is called the pulmonary because it's going to the lungs semilunar valve. So this door is going to lead us into the pulmonary trunk and out to the lungs to get oxygen. We're going to close it behind us so we can't come back into the right ventricle. All right, so that's the right side with deoxygenated blood. We're in the pulmonary trunk. We go out the left and right pulmonary arteries. We get some oxygen and now we need to come back to the heart and we need to come in on the oxygenated side. The oxygenated side is the left side. The left side is going to pump to the body eventually, but we need to get into the left atrium. And the left atrium on this heart is this yellow uh, structure here, and it doesn't look very big from the anterior view. So when you're facing it, that looks rather small. But you and I know that the left side of the heart is large. And so where the bulk of the left side is, is on the posterior surface of the heart. Follow this yellow all the way around and look at the size of the actual left atrium. So the left atrium is large, but most of it sits behind the heart where you can't see it on the model unless you look on the back. So we have this left large, this left atrium here is large. How are we going to get into the left atrium? We remember that arteries go away from the heart and veins return. So we're going to come back in upstairs with our oxygen through four veins. One, two, one, two, and then the other two are on the other side. Three, four. All right, so I'm going to put my fingers where they're located. One, two, three, four pulmonary veins coming into the left atrium. Now, if you forget, you can always look in the left atrium and see that there are two dots there. 
Let's see if I can get you a view of that. Oops. It's light. So there's the two dots for the left pulmonary veins. And then if you look inside, if you look inside, there are two more dots for the right pulmonary veins. That's a total of four. If you forget how many pulmonary veins there are, so you can just look into the left atrium and see. All right, so I've got my four pulmonary veins coming into the left atrium with oxygen. As they come into the left atrium, now I need to go down to the left ventricle. I've got to get to this large left ventricle so I can get out to the body. I'm gonna pass through what's called the bicuspid, or you could call it the mitral valve. Easier to call it bicuspid because you can count. There are two cusps, two flaps of white tissue. They are held in place by two groups of cordiae tendineae. And so if you just count one, two, it reminds you that that's the bicuspid. Again, you could also call it mitral. You can call both of these valves the right and left atrioventricular valves if you prefer. All right, so we're on, we're passing through the bicuspid valve or door, and we need to shut it once we get down into the left ventricle. Now we're in this large left ventricle. It might not look large from your view. Let me show you where most of the left ventricle is. You can see it on the front here, on the anterior. So you can see that it goes all the way around. So I'm gonna put my hand on the left ventricle. You see how large it is. It has to pump to the entire body. And so it's the largest chamber or room in the heart. We're in it right now. Remember that the cords, this one is not attached because the wall was open here for your viewing. But remember that the cords are attached to these ridges of muscle called papillary muscles. And that this odd interior of the heart itself, of the endocardium, these ridges, uh, I'm sorry, these trabecula or these beams are called trabecula carniae. So a papillary muscle is attached to the cordiae tendineae, and those are attached to the cusps of a valve. The trabecula carniae is just the entire interior surface of the ventricle that looks like spongy bone. Now we're in this left ventricle. We have to get out. We have to go to the brain. We have to go to all the organs. We need to take oxygen everywhere. And how we're going to get out of here is we're going to go to the aorta. We need to get to the aorta through something called the aortic semilunar valve. Let's see if I can angle the light here. The aortic semilunar valve is up behind the bicuspid valve. There it is. So it's up behind the bicuspid valve. I'm shining a light on it. Notice that if I were to follow, if I were to just follow up behind that valve, or follow the valve through, I would wind up, I'm pointing at the aorta, which is here. So the direction of flow is this way, right? So this is the direction of flow through the aortic semilunar valve. I have to shut that door on my way out of the left ventricle so that blood does not try to flow back into it from the aorta. And now I can go out the aorta, up to the brain, out to the arms, down the body, and into the organs, into the limbs, and perfuse the entire system with oxygen. Let's talk about what else you can see on here. One thing I'm going to do is open and look at the atria. Actually, I'm going to open the whole thing. I'm going to take my hand this way, and I'm going to pinch into the atria. So I'm holding the heart by either atria right now, and my fingers are coming together at something called the intraatrial septum, the interatrial septum. Septum means wall, or curtain, actually. And so this curtain, or this wall, and this curtain, or wall, the division, they divide the two atria. So they are the interatrial septum. I can hold the heart model this way. Let's look at the interventricular septum. The interventricular septum, on the other hand, is between the two ventricles. So I could hold the heart this way by the interventricular septum, couldn't I? Yep, so here's the septum, this wall. 
on the right ventricle and here's the septum the wall on the left ventricle so the wall between the two ventricles is the interventricular septum i'm pointing that out because the thing we're going to look at on top of them is sitting directly uh, over that interventricular septum i'm going to point one more thing out and we'll come back to the anterior surface of the heart and look at the vessels if i were to open the model and look at this uh, bit of muscle here and there's another bit of muscle here it would be easy to identify but on the left ventricle it's very thick you can see the width of it is rather thick the width of it and so this muscle here would be called the myocardium myocardium that just means heart muscle myocardium as opposed to the interventricular septum which is still the myocardium. But as far as identification goes, you want to identify this part as myocardium. And then if, they're, uh, if they want you to identify the wall, they mean interventricular septum or interatrial septum between the atria. All right, so now let's think about some of these vessels we're seeing on the outside of the heart. I'm going to make a quick drawing. I'm going to make a quick drawing so that you can understand what's this structure and what this structure is called. If we're thinking about, say, a dry riverbed, I like that analogy. Let's say this is a dry riverbed or a dry creek bed. And so you have the bank on either side, the bank of the creek. Maybe you're spelling everything incorrectly. It's all right. So we have the banks of the creek here. And then this is a dry creek. There's no water in it. So we have this impression in the earth where the water used to run, but now it's just kind of a shadow of where the creek used to be. And if we think about this impression, it's very much like putting your finger in clay and lifting your finger out of it. You would leave an impression of your finger uh, or of your thumb or your finger in the clay. This impression would be called a sulcus. S-U-L-C-U-S. -S, sulcus. So this just means an impression. And on the heart, I have a sulcus on the front or on the anterior surface. What I've put in the sulcus, or what is lying in the sulcus, are these two structures, these two vessels, this artery and this vein. So we could think about if this was a cross section of a sulcus, I could put a vein here and an artery right next to it, and they could run on the inside of this empty riverbed again, or this impression. So now let's look again at the heart. thinking about what is a sulcus, and I think it's a place that I could put some things, like laying uh, two vessels into that empty riverbed. Here they are. And so because we said this was the interventricular septum, this wall, this space here that is dividing the heart into the right and left sides, this line down the center of the heart, is actually the interventricular sulcus with coronary vessels on it. So this is the interventricular sulcus with coronary vessels. Later, you, later you'll learn the names of these vessels, the great cardiac vein and the left anterior descending artery. Uh, but we're not going to worry about that right now. We're just going to call it the interventricular sulcus with coronary vessels, noting that it divides the heart into right and left halves. So it is a vertical line down the center of the heart that runs from the base to the apex down at the point. So because there's an anterior one, an anterior interventricular sulcus, we could assume that there's one on the posterior. So there it is. Here's the posterior interventricular sulcus 
with coronary vessels. Posterior interventricular sulcus with coronary vessels, dividing again the heart on the right and the left sides. So this is another vertical division, and it's just on the back of the uh, interventricular septum. So this is the posterior interventricular sulcus with coronary vessels. Now, those two divide the heart into right and left. There is a set of, uh, there is a sulcus that divides the, at least the left side of the heart into superior and inferior, or divides the atria from the ventricles. And if we look here, this little division of the uh, left coronary artery and vein, these guys are running around at a horizontal. So they're going side to side. So we're back on the anterior part of the heart. We can see that the artery and vein are running around the left side, dividing the atria from the ventricle. And so this is the atrioventricular sulcus, named for what it does, atrioventricular sulcus. And if you trace it around, follow around to the back of the left side, we see that this blue vein widens considerably. Can you see that? So this blue vein on the posterior surface right underneath the left atrium widens. It's running in the atrioventricular sulcus and it gets very wide before it returns its blood into the right atrium. This name, the name for this blue widened vein on the posterior surface of the heart is the coronary sinus, S-I-N-U-S. You guys know that sinuses drain things, and so that actually does drain the heart's deoxygenated blood, the blood that the heart has used in order to run its um, oxygen demands, its muscle oxygen demands. If we look in the right atrium where there's deoxygenated blood, we recall that the superior vena cava dumped its blood right there. The inferior vena cava entered there, and then you'll see another little dot right there. That is where the coronary sinus enters the right atrium. So we have those three, superior vena cava, inferior vena cava, and coronary sinus. All three of those are converging on the right atrium with their deoxygenated blood. I think that's it on I do want to point out, just for later, that if you think about a piece of paper and you're naming the vessels on the heart, if you're thinking about a piece of paper that you would get a lined piece of paper, and the piece of paper usually has a line running down the side of it, and the sides of the piece of paper are called margins. Anything to the side is a margin. Something's marginalized, it's to the side. So if we think about on a piece of paper, anything to the side is a margin. If we look at the heart, when you're naming the arteries and the veins, we said that the things in the center were the anterior interventricular sulcus and coronary vessels for this exam, and then the posterior uh, interventricular sulcus and coronary vessels. If you look to the side, you'll see that there are some arteries and veins on the sides of the heart. And you can guess that those are called marginal. Those are the marginal arteries and veins, and that's just a way to think about them. All right, you can see other things like ligamentum arteriosum here, um, but that's enough for this particular video.